Xenos by Dan Abnett. This is the first book in the Isilhorn trilogy for Warhammer 40k, and one I've read and reviewed before here on the channel, but that was years ago, and with the upcoming announced attempts to release a Warhammer 40k adaptation, I figured it might be a good time to try and get on back into this franchise. The Warhammer 40k world is definitely one to be reckoned with within science fiction and fantasy, and I'm curious to see just how deep the rabbit hole goes. And to be perfectly honest, I did pick up the second book in the Isilhorn trilogy, and it just was too long since I read the first one. I had no idea what was going on, so I decided to go, screw it, let's reread Xenos first. You can't be mad about that. I am legally allowed to reread things, damn it. Now, what exactly the Isilhorn trilogy is for the Warhammer 40k world is kind of interesting to me, and I'm happy it's where I've chosen my point of entry because it's a specific kind of niche genre I do really enjoy within this universe. And for anyone curious to get into Warhammer 40k, I think it's important to remember that. This isn't exactly like a Middle Earth situation where there's just one series to get through, and instead it's got multiple different stories going on, more similar to the Cosmere but with a lot more books and more authors contributing. And apparently as a result, a lot of the series within the Black Library are a subgenre within military sci-fi, and the Isilhorn trilogy specifically is like an investigative detective within military science fiction. And if you know me, I like me some detective stuff. And what I remember specifically about the last time I read Xenos was that I liked the world and the character work surprised me. There was quite a bit of action, but I had a positive impact from this entry and introduction to the Warhammer 40k universe overall. And I think I don't like it quite as much this time while appreciating angles of the story more than I did before, mostly because I'm just a more experienced reader who knows what to look for and appreciate. Better. For my own personal taste, military action-heavy science fiction needs to be very well written to be engaging, which unfortunately for that specific subgenre is not always the case. You will have some weaker writers trying to have this much action and keep it engaging, but it's like a poorly done 80s action movie. If there's not reasonable character or plot to back up the big bombastic bows, eventually they just kind of become disinteresting because your brain adjusts to that level of stimulation and you're just like, okay, I get it, action, but why action? And this is directly related to something I've talked about here on the channel before for horror, at least my specific taste for horror. It needs to be beautifully written to an extent. Like Stephen King will have pretty straightforward prose until he gets to a horrific scene and then he really touches up the exact pacing of his writing and how certain word choices are gonna hit the reader become fundamental for the entire structure of the passage you're reading that's supposed to terrify you. I feel like Dan Abnett does something similar with his action sequences where there's always a really clear method to the madness. Yes, chaos ensues because, you know, action, bombs, explosions, superpowered people with psychic abilities, Warhammer, but there's a beauty in the dryness. And I think that's the difference between writing really good horror and really good action. Whereas horror needs to be purple, action needs to be straightforward to an extent so that the reader can always keep in line with what the character is doing. Dan Abnett does that while also making sure there is a beauty to the awfulness of what's occurring to keep you invested on that multiple levels of not only are you following it, you're enjoying the reading experience, and you're impressed by the writing, which elevated above it just being another pa -pow, pa -pow, pa -pow, pa -pow, pa pow And Xenos very thankfully balances all of that out pretty spectacularly for the amount of overaction it has. And I do have to specifically say overaction because this time through specifically, it just became a bit too much. Maybe it's just rereading action sequences is not as engaging as the first time, but wow, was it just so many instances of like people talking, a bit of dialogue, then out of nowhere, surprise, gun! This is without question the most action heavy book I have ever ever read, and I would genuinely not be surprised to see that over 40% of the words within this story are dedicated to action. And unfortunately, it does seep into a little bit of the territory of the way our character handles these situations, feeling a little bit formulaic at times. Though their characterization is strong enough, it feels like it's the experience within them that allows them to handle them in similar ways, but it's also the way the character thinks about other people, approaches other people, 
there's almost this routine to it by the end of the book that maybe again, because reread, I really started to pick up on. But please keep in mind that I said, yes, it's a bit too much for my own personal taste, but it makes up a lot for being that bit too much with Dan Abnett's writing. This author is not only doing a really good job of immersing you as the reader into this epic world with their prose, which are far above average, but their control of character really allows a lot of the action to keep you invested because of Isolhorn. Isenhorn? Oh, damn it. Isenhorn. Why did my brain put an L in there? Now that titular main character, Gregor Isenhorn, is an inquisitor, meaning they work within the controlled planets of the government body they work for with near limitless power. Their prime directive is to hunt down anyone who is working against the God Emperor. And yes, within the Warhammer 40k universe, there is the God Emperor of mankind who is apparently just leading this faction against other warring factions and rebel groups and stuff. And I'm not gonna lie, even on reread, having this be my introduction to the Warhammer 40k universe, there was a whole lot of times where I just went, okay, that's the group of good. No, okay, they're bad. Our protagonist is working for them, but possibly is there good over here? I'm confusion. But I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. And I have complete faith that if I got more into the Warhammer 40k universe, which I do plan to do, a lot more of this is going to become cleared up to me. But as someone, an initial reader, which is the perspective this review is from, getting into Xenos or the Isolhorn trilogy or Warhammer 40k as a whole can be a bit overwhelming. And I'm used to stuff like Malice and Lord of the Rings, but those are overwhelming too at first. So if you're an experienced reader of truly epic fantasy, I think you'll actually be fine. You're just going to have those moments you're used to of like, I don't get it yet, but I have faith that I will. And that actually gets me to talking about Gregor Eisenhorn, who is someone who I think most of my interest, most of my draw to them throughout this story as a character came from the fact that they lack a little bit of self-awareness, which Dan Abnett is brilliantly utilizing to actually kind of flesh out the different factions within the faction that Isenhorn is working for. There are other Inquisitors who view Gregor Isenhorn as someone who is a heretic, someone who is an extremist in some ways, or possibly disloyal, but all they're really doing is just asking some questions or wanting to change the way things are done for the betterment of what they are working for. And they're just questioning some philosophy in some ways that actually leads to some pretty interesting thoughts being brought to the surface within Xenos. And with any good mystery detective hunting type story, which if you boil Xenos down, that's what it kind of is at the core of it. You need ideas like that being played with to maintain interest. And it's fascinating to see that tried and true formula of a good detective story has a lot of interesting moral or philosophical questions being played throughout it to kind of uplift the ideas that maybe cause the crime or event to happen. It's just being blown up for Warhammer 40k and taken to an extreme, but it's the same formula working extraordinarily well. And any Warhammer 40k diehard fans out there. Let me know if I'm picking up on something that's not there, but it feels like you're going to constantly have to be aware in this universe that depending on how die hard the character you're following is to their faction, there's continually a little bit of unreliable narrator here in terms of skewing arguments pretty hardcore that are relevant to the wider universe and things that are going on. And that that's going to draw me into reading a lot more Warhammer 40k if that's a continual thing, because I really like the idea of that being played with on like a grand scale multi-factional thing. I did have some of the same problem I think that I had the first time with Xenos, where it's just not entirely my type of science fiction. I'm not that big into military fantasy, but even if Warhammer 40k is consistently this military action heaven fantasy in science fiction throughout, I'm not going to mind that too much, because if most books have this philosophy of using the military sci-fi setting of this gargantuan universe to do interesting things, I don't really care that it's not necessarily a skinning over top that is not my taste, because once you get to the nougaty rich center of where the author is flexing their ability and muscle, then yeah, me as a reader who's paying attention is going to have fun with it, just for looking at the great setup and payoff and ideas and characterization going on, which Dan Abnett is doing. And I inevitably end up wondering if like the Isolhorn trilogy, if it wasn't connected to Warhammer 4, Okay, let's say you somehow remove that element and just published it as it is, if it would garner a larger fan base and grow in a way where it didn't have the 
baggage of like, okay, you need to get into all of this stuff. Cause I don't think you necessarily do to appreciate what's going on here. Yeah. There was stuff where I was like, I'm not sure what that was, but at the same time, the actual core and the focus of this narrative, that crucial part of the story, I was never feeling detached or disconnected from. It was all just world stuff. So even if you don't necessarily want to get into Warhammer 40k, I just recommend Xenos on its own is what I'm trying to get at here. I think you can not be interested in Warhammer 40k, but still really enjoy Xenos, at least, especially if you like action. Oh my god, because I am literally not exaggerating. Oh, okay, sorry, one second. Heretics, you know what I mean? Oh, don't worry, small price to pay for the Emperor. So the story itself of Xenos here, getting into the buildup, is we actually pick up with Isenhorn right as they have a companion who has died. And as I think most action-heavy sci-fi books should do just to entice you, the reader, and also let you know what you're getting in for, this really kicks off with a bang, 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 bang. And then Den Abnett utilizes that opening of just conflict to then showcase a lot of the politics that are going on, not only in the planet that Eisenhorn starts on, but the wider situation they're in and a case that we're kind of picking up in the middle of them with, which surprised me. Very often you just kind of have like a lot of these mystery type stories start off with a complete introduction with the investigator or inquisitor learning as the reader does. But instead we're kind of playing catch up with Eisenhorn Horn, which is a character choice I actually really think pays off and helps build them up as a protagonist, feeling very superior, not only to the people around them they're using, but to us, the reader. This is a character who sees things very clearly, especially who they're hunting and targeting, but also has flaws and faults that, especially if like me throughout this story, you're really questioning the institution they're working for. You end up having this very perplexed positioning as a reader where you kind of have to take everything at face value, but also question it all, which builds this greater air of mystery. And then by the halfway point of the book, you realize you're not even sure Who's morally in the right or wrong? Because asking me to be on the side of someone who works for the God Emperor? No, I'm good. But without getting into spoilers, the people that are being targeted and hunted are doing things. You're like, I don't support that either. Are we all the baddies? So in conclusion, yeah, I think Xenos is a bit much in terms of the action heavy department to the point where it began to detract from my enjoyment a little bit, but I respect the writing and the world that's being built for me enough that I'm absolutely tantalized and want to get deeper into it. And I have a fairly strong suspicion that Warhammer 40K becomes extremely addictive in terms of the world that is presented to us. And there's so much room to grow as a franchise that I'm really curious to see because I know people pointed me at this trilogy for a specific reason saying it was one of the strongest of all of the black library so will I get addicted enough to want to read even the weaker entries or is this going to suffer from what a lot of franchises that have multiple authors writing into it suffer from where it all begins to feel so disconnected that my overall attachment is to just a core set of things going on in the universe and once those are over I kind of become uninterested let me know if you're a Warhammer 40k fan in the comments down below if that was the case for you, or if you did kind of balloon out and just caring about it all. But those were just my rethoughts on Xenos and a way for me to let you all know that I am getting back into the Warhammer world and with the whole cinematic endeavors on the distant horizon, it seems like a good time for you too as well if you have not given it a go. And I would recommend Xenos. I'm gonna give it a light seven out of 10 and say that I probably enjoyed it a little bit less, but that might just be because it's a book that's more enjoyable in the first time through and not necessarily necessarily for rereads. Like and subscribe if you have not already, and hit the Patreon if you want to support what I do here. Have a good one, y'all. Ow! Peace!